we're going to start and hopefully more people will join um, from outside as we start. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is uh, sort of an experiment. It's the first time we're doing something like this in uh, an OWASP conference. Um, but being that we're in Israel and that there's been a lot of um, innovation here around AppSec over the years, uh, we decided to theme this conference around innovation and part of that is uh, this event. So before I get into this event, just for those of you who are not familiar, and I already apologize to everybody I forgot, but I put some of the earlier application security related companies and who they were acquired by or for just check marks and imperva that are still independent who they weren't acquired by yet. Um, there's been a lot of innovation in Israel and I think, uh, and Amit Klein who's our next keynote, he was one of the founders of Sanctum and he's gonna talk about it. I think it was 99 when I first, they were still called Perfecto and it was the first time I saw a demonstration of parameter tampering in a talk that probably you gave uh, somewhere and I was blown away by that concept. That was 20 years ago. It's 20 years to AppScan. And, and Sanctum produced the first WAF and the first DAST, which are now part of, of uh, HCL, which you can see here in F5. Um, but we've had a lot of other companies. We've had Breach, which became Trustwave and Imperva in the WAF space. We had Seeker, which was my company, uh, that became part of Synopsys and Checkmarks. It's still independent. We also had a bunch of companies in database security. Um, area, right, Guardium and, Ma and Centrigo, also Imperva, um, and I didn't put their logos on because they're still younger, but we also have now in the software composition analysis a couple of uh, upcoming Israeli companies. They're both out here, White Source and SNCC. And so you see that Israel is a big source for AppSec um, incubation and innovation, and we thought it would be a good place to start this thing, which I hope will become a tradition for OSP events to let innovation show up. And the basic idea of an innovation showcase like that is to let early stage companies that are not always ready to be a sponsor because they don't have the money and they don't have the marketing people to support it because being a sponsor is a lot of uh, resources and effort to showcase some innovative ideas. Yeah, some of them might not make it to, to production, but it's gonna be interesting for us to hear them. And, um, and give the audience opportunity to see some of the new things coming. And so we did a call of innovation uh, for the last couple of months, asked startups to submit. Um, and now the format is gonna be pretty simple, pretty standard, we're not making anything up, right? Each startup gets five minutes to pitch up to 10 slides. Um, we didn't want to be too strict about the format, so you'll see they all have a different format, but they all must address uh, the problem they're trying to solve, the solution that they have, um, how is it different than what's in the market, and the team, because with the wrong team you don't get anywhere. Um, and then after they're done with their five minute pitch, which will be cut at five minutes exactly, um, I'll come back on stage and ask them maybe one or two questions. We don't have time in this format for questions for the audience because we need to be quick. Uh, but all of these uh, companies will come to our networking event tonight, which takes place in the Paris Center for Innovation and Peace. Um, it's gonna be a fun event regardless and you also get an opportunity to talk to these companies and ask them questions and see a demo maybe um, if you want. And then we're at, gonna ask you to vote. And I want to let you all know we've put in place a very sophisticated security mechanism. No, we haven't. It's really, really just a friendly community vote. There's zero security. Don't try to hack it because there's nothing to hack. Um, so be kind to the community. Vote once. Don't go around and spoof stuff. Um, so we're going to ask you to vote for the company that you feel did the best pitch and has the best idea. And, and basically the question is, who would you invest in out of these uh, six startup companies? Um, and tomorrow morning, uh, during the opening notes, we'll announce the winner. And the winner gets $1 million investment. No, they get nothing. They just get a recognition. Um, 
But that's fun too, right? So the criteria to be here um, was to be an early stage startup, be related to AppSec. We weren't too strict about it, but you know, not an endpoint platform. Um, be young, up to three years, uh, and be small. So less than $1 million in revenue and less than $10 million in funding. Um, and I think everybody's in, within this criteria. So we have six companies. These are their names. I'm gonna present them one by one as we start this. Um, so I hope you're gonna have fun. I hope it's gonna be interesting. And I hope all these companies are gonna become unicorns. So without further ado, let's bring the first speaker. Roy Cohen from Vicarious. Okay, thanks everyone, I'm super excited, and let me also set up the timer because offer is very strict with time, so yeah, let's begin. Um, I would like to share a short story with you, if that's okay. Uh, two or three years ago, I got a phone call in the middle of the night just to pick up the phone and see that the commander in my army just called me. He said, leave whatever you're doing, rush to the base. So I put on my uniform and rush to the base just to see all the soldiers running around and what happened if you remember there was an outbreak of uh, um, uh, WannaCry and if, as you recall there was a vulnerability there related to SMB. Um, the thing was that the servers there were not patched and it's not like the soldier, soldiers were not uh, experienced or had no uh, skills or were lazy. It's a very hard task to keep your environment maintained. Um, just to put some lights on the big challenge here, Every month, a thousand new vulnerabilities are being disclosed. This is just uh, public figures. We don't speak about things which are you know, sold in the dark net or not yet discovered. Um, from the moment of you as a research, uh, as a hacker, you, when you disclose a vulnerability, up until the moment the end customers can patch it, it takes almost six months, which is a huge gap, the golden gap for hackers to breach in. Um, and the research conducted by the US District of Defense claims that 90% of every cyber attack, at least in 2017, uh, was involving at least one one-day vulnerability. And this is the reason exactly we started Vicarious, to protect any software, any time, on any device. Um, the team is a compound of people who've been there and done that. Uh, we got the CEO, Michael Asaf, which was among the first employees of Secure Islands, a company got acquired by Microsoft related to DLP. Um, Yossi is our amazing CTO, was the first employee of an endpoint security company called Cybertinal, and developed a product from a lot of Python scripts to something which you can sell worldwide, and later on acquired by Cyborg. As for myself, I'm, I'm a Ram graduate, I got uh, awarded by the president and the general for my activity in this field, um, was doing a lot of penetration testing and security research, and was leading the research for uh, Cybertinal, and later on for Cyborg, and then joining Vicarious. So let me share with you what we're doing. Uh, our goal here is to promote the field of vulnerability scanning and also fixing the issues. The way we achieve that is by developing our own three property engines. Uh, the first one is called prediction. Its goal is to, aside of the fact we can give you the same old vulnerability scanning report, we are actively searching for vulnerabilities within the customer's environment. The way we do that is by doing binary code analysis. We collect all the binaries uh, related to a certain application and we check if there is something which may result into a risk for the, for the customer. Uh, by doing so, we can give him a full visibility report of what the issues he got, something which is known and unknown. Once we got all the visibility of the issues, we can prioritize. We can actually see, based on the dynamic features of the, the dynamic features of the application, whether it can be exploited. Today, almost two thirds of the vulnerabilities got an exploit. So, doing some uh, um, exploitation attempts doesn't necessarily help you to decide which of the vulnerabilities are relevant for you. Um, fi finally, we got an ability to do protection. Um, the way we achieve that is by either doing the actual patching or on top of that we can do virtual patching. We can wrap the application with our own proprietary technology and alert the customer whether there is an exploit or even block the attempt. In terms of uh, differentiation, yeah, cool. So first of all, uh, we can help our customers to close the patching window. It's the time in between the, they are allowed to shut down the server and doing some updates. Um, we can reduce the amount of vulnerabilities they need to focus on. We had an amazing research, at least 90% of the vulnerabilities are not relevant to be patched, so we can give a very good work on that. 
Um, and on top of that, we can show them vulnerabilities they are not aware of, uh, which is also a unique uh, value proposition here. Um, that's it. I think I made it under five minutes. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. So you say you use binary analysis to analyze the binaries and fix them. So is it to detect known vulnerabilities or do you scan for new vulnerabilities? So we are taking a step into finding unknown vulnerabilities, things which are signature-less. Uh, we see there is a market, market advancement into this field. We see some competitors now popping up all over the place. Um, and we see there is a, a significant need in the market for finding issues before hackers do. And this is what we're trying to achieve here. Of course. Um, so, so I'll ask you one more question. I think there, there are a couple of vendors already obviously doing uh, static analysis for, for binary and so on. Um, how do you plan to prevent your virtual patching to have false positives and block things that should work? Um, we just got funded. We are now allocating all our funds for uh, reducing false positive to better um, improve our algorithms. And uh, we got now new researchers. We also got um, uh, the vast majority of the employees are females, which is amazing. Um, it is amazing. Yeah. Um, so we are now focusing very deeply on reducing false positive, improving our algorithms, and achieving this very goal. OK, thank you very much. So let me call on stage our next speaker, Tal Melamed from Protego Labs. Thank you. Five minutes go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tal Melamed. I'm the head of security research at a startup called uh, Protego Labs. We provide a serverless security uh, solution and a the first question that I'm being asked usually is, uh, what is serverless? Uh, so uh, I'll get to that in a second. We've been founded uh, at 2017. Uh, we do integration with serverless on AWS on GA and uh, private bet on uh, Google and Azure. We work hard with OS, the OS community. We are sharing some project, which I have talks tomorrow, but it's not a talk pitch. Um, we are an AWS uh, advanced partner. We've, we won a couple of awards, and then I'll start talking about uh, what serverless is. So serverless, if you don't know, it's a new technology by the cloud providers um, that get, live, uh, lets companies run code without being, uh, deal, having to deal with uh, anything else. So containers, patching, OS, it's out of the picture. You just run code. And we believe that this is the future because everyone goes there. Uh, from the providers, Amazon, uh, the big companies like Google, Azure, uh, Amazon, IBM, SAP, name it. Uh, and the companies are growing and growing. Uh, Netflix, Capital One, Amtrak, Uber, everyone is starting to use serverless. So this is why we believe that it's the future. And it has a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, as I can see, in the security point of view, you, have, you don't have anything else other than AppSec. It leaves you only with AppSec. Secure, AppSec. So we are there to uh, help you. Why is it different or what is the problem here in regular AppSec? Uh, there are a couple. Uh, no perimeter. That means that there is nothing that you have besides the a specific input to your code. Uh, that means that you don't own the network, so you cannot put WAF or anything else. That means that the perimeter is now very ambiguous, and it can come from different sources. And um, it could be triggers by event times, uh, upload files, and everything. Uh, there is no server, of course. The, I mean, you don't own the server. There are servers, they're just not yours. So you cannot install anything like RASP. Um, it's event triggered, so there could be thousands and hundreds of inputs to your functions, and you don't see anything other than the entry point to your function. And it's more agile because it's a microservices uh, technology or architecture that means that it helps you speed up the development. You can write small functions, uh, and 
It makes it more complex for security. So what we do is we prevent, uh, we provide you with a security solution that helps you make uh, security really strict in terms of, think about it, if it's that um, microservices can be very granular. So we have, uh, let me skip. We have a couple of things. We scan uh, the functions for low, uh, to provide least privilege. Uh, permission, so that means that we give you the function. Think about it, each piece of code has its own list privilege uh, permission, and it's based on the cloud, and we provide runtime environment uh, protection, so think about it as like WAF, but not really WAF because it's not in the network, and then we prevent um, bad inputs, AppSec attacks coming to your application. AppSec any AppSec attacks that you can think of, which they are kind of different, but it's not the topic today. We can be start from the CICD, make your application secure from bottom up, but we can also integrate with anything else uh, on your SIEM and runtime uh, environments. Um, that's it. If you want to see hear more uh, about it, then uh, join me at the networking event. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to understand something. Um, you say no RAS, but then you say you do runtime self-protection. Yeah. So isn't that essentially RAS for serverless? Well, it's not RAS because it's not a server. Uh, we sit on, uh, there is no server. So yes. we sit as a layer at your function or in le level. So that means that we, we like wrap the environment, the code, but since there is no server to install anything run, there is no anything Rasp. So we okay. sit on a, on, a, on a code. We're, as, as it said, I did not have time to explain it, but we're code-centric. So we're very uh, sitting on the code of the, fu of the function without changing it. Um, OK. And then you also do scanning of the code? That's true. So uh, as part, um, we can do it either on runtime or on CICD, but what we do is that we um, think it, since it's very uh, like um, cloud centric, that means that your code is very small, probably, and it integrates with um, cloud resources. So what we do is that we scan the, the code, and based on both traffic and static analysis, we provide you with a least privileged permission for that specific function. So each function gets its own uh, thing. In AppSec world, it's like a dream. Each function has its own permission, and it's limited to only what it needs to be. Okay. Thank you very much. It sounds Thank very you. interesting. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let me call our next speaker, CNLN from Ixden. Here we go. Thank you, Ofer. Five minutes. Here we go. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Tzion Arel, CEO and co-founder of iXDEN, and we're providing a new approach for securing IoT devices. So let's look at this uh, critical uh, infrastructure, electro uh, manufacturer, uh, providing electronic uh, services. Now there is IoT sensors coming in, connected the uh, new all through controller gateways uh, into a management and control system making critical decision with those information. But we all know that those devices which are uh, pretty much the weakest, list, uh, weakest uh, link in the channel are have three uh, major disadvantages. First, they have lack of power, no operational system, the cost, the footprint, all of those things are uh, creating a very big problem to make uh, a security using a standard uh, uh, way, uh, especially when there are 40 billion of them coming in into those critical infrastructure operations. So the big problem, how can we make sure that those sensors through these uh, gateways are providing us the real data and not the fake data? And this is the big problem that we are facing here. So I extend providing a new solution actually to secure those organizations through a, a software that actually protecting the data at source. We are focusing on the edge device, 
uh, and providing two anchors for the software. The first one, we create a, the way that we create a biometric approach, a, a kind of identity for any IoT device, meaning sensor, uh, which is uh, we're looking at the device. We are saying biometric because we are creating such an identity which is very similar to a biometric identity of a person, which is, uh, uh, have a lot of parameters that are changing every, every second and dynamic. The way that we create the, the identity is by collecting information through an agent that sits in, in the gateway or the controller and collect information from three different layers, from the sensor itself, the physical information, what is measured, the network that is talking, the network, and the metadata on this, uh, of this server. All together we have one big identity, which is dynamic, changing every second. Uh, and this identity is generating every transaction and it's not stored in the device. That's also another unique, there is no key here and no certification. The second far, uh, uh, part is the multi-factor authentication, which is the server side, there's all the logic there. And there, which, what we do there is actually taking the uh, identity of the device that we created. And uh, we created a, a platform that enables us to do a multi-factor authentication, meaning that we can use these hundreds of parameters that we have been collected, which is dynamic, and actually uh, allowed us to give in a, a score for the transaction, a high score meaning that what is the uh, probability that this device that sent the information to this uh, uh, control and management system is your device. Usually we're looking at 99.6 and above in percentage. So basically what we do is attestation for any IoT device, and this is the big uh, things. Why we are different? Because we are sitting on a, in, on the, in the front on the edge device before it even goes to the network and with, then we're looking for anomaly. So our solution is actually on the front before uh, the data is coming into the network and looking for anomaly, which is a uh, uh, thing. Our customers are uh, electric, water, gas and oil company and the way that we are going to the market is through partners uh, through ICS vendors, IoT manufacturing, and even the chip design, which can be installed, our solution there. Company uh, raised seed funding uh, from uh, VCs in the States and in Israel, and now we're expanding the, the company into the international business. We are uh, three entrepreneurs, over 25 years of experience working in big software companies. And our vision is to be installed in any IoT device on the manufacturer exam. So it will be embedded when it goes to the consumer. Thank you very much. If you have a question, be answered well. Thank you. So I have two questions. Just to clarify, so you're talking about any IoT device, but your slides kind of indicate you're going more on the commercial, industrial, uh, large-scale IoT and not so much on personal IoT, is that correct? I mean, the code and the software can re be related to any IoT device. Sensor for us is anything that actually connected to a network and provide information. We are focusing right now on the industrial side because they're the big money and the big pain. Of but course. the software can be go to even to transportation, smart cities and, and those things. And, and then my next question is, so you're looking, before it goes to the network, you're ver validating the data and just so I understand, you're signing it somehow or you're putting something on it so that it can later be verified? Yes, it's kind of a very tiny agent that we install over the air or over the ground in, inside the, on the controller or in the, near the controller, collecting data. It's a dummy software, right? But the, and then it brings us to the server and the server is doing all the analytics and the machine learning and AI. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, our next, next speaker from L7 Defense, Doron Hema. Uh, Good afternoon, my name is Doron Shemak, CEO and co-founder of L7 Defense. Uh, today, I would like to coin a new term in API security, which is API isolation. Now, you can think about web isolation, which was originally term for browser, uh, sandboxing. Let's see what, it, what that means for us. Starting with the AI story that originally the, the company started with, 
we have a unique AI technology which is defined as unsupervised learning and it's very, it is very helpful to approach any, I would say, major security problem. And in this, in this uh, 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 concept, we started to work toward the API security. Now, the major fact about this technology that it is fully autonomous, which is essentially very critical for any API security, and it's very highly controlled and measured by the, the false positive and false, po and false negative rate. So it worked great. Now, and this is the proof of that. This is a word that we got in 2018 as for the engine of the, that the company was uh, uh, developed by Frost Sullivan. And let's go for that from, from here. Okay, what would be AI empowered API isolation? That's a good, that's a good question. And let's start walking through. Starting at layer one. We have here three, three different layers of defense. All, each one of those is made by the same engine, the immune system. There is the WAF system, there is the uh, antibot system, and there is the DDoS system. Each one of those is taking a different sample of traffic. For instance, the WAF is taking 100% of the traffic, of course, in order to mitigate attack coming in, while DDoS is needed only 5% normally from the traffic coming in in order to avoid that. So we have here different concerns treated by different machine, AI machine. Now, going to the second layer, isolation by entities. Each of the API, API X, API Y, and API Z, is controlled by different clone set of those machines. Each one of those. Now, imagine that you got the let's say thousands of different APIs, you got different sets, different a thousand API sets, API different sets, it's working for you. Each one is totally separate with totally different AI baseline working for each one of those AI. Think about login and logout, each one of those got a totally different a, a set of machine working for them. This is the second layer. Third layer would be process-wise. Now think about the ability to simulate attack coming in before it coming in. So this is the first layer. Well, we are evaluating the attack coming in through the request, simulate it, and decide whether it go to, layer to, to the second layer. And then when we get the results, we again inspect it in full and recognize whether Actually, there is some sort of vulnerability there in the, in the reply coming in. And only that, there is the ability to expose yes or not the results to the client, which was acting, uh, uh, looking for this, for this reply. So you got here a process isolation as well. And last, you got also a policy isolation while the AI system take off, pop up, the policy, the existing policy Let's call it the white, a white, uh, 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 the white list of what is going on in those fields, for instance, whether it's alphanumeric, integer, or so on. So you got here something which is being done automatically, while you can also, for a documented API, you can also implement per each API its own policy. So just to recap what we got here, we got AI that actually works. We got ability to protect on each API, totally isolated from each other APIs. We got ability to protect from major type of attack at the API level, and basically the system is plug and play. This is the team. You're familiar with me already. Israel Gross is here in the audience. He's taking the biz dev, and Mark Ginsburg coming from Matsov unit, which is taking the R&D. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. You, you talk about this API WAF. Is that real time? So totally. every request is real time? Totally. And how do you deal with um, machine learning or AI uh, false positives? OK. This is a very good question, because every of those machines, each one of those, the DDoS, the WAF, and the, and the WAF, and the, and the antibot are measured for this type of a, a, a false positive and false negative. And those machines were measured for almost two years now. And the false positive rate 
believe it or not, is very close to zero. You're familiar with the normal WAF scenario, so it's quite surprising, I know. So I, 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 even if it's very close, if you block valid traffic, that could be an issue. Yeah, so in this case, we have also a clustering approach. We're taking full range of those which are suspicious to be false positive in this manner. We take them into packages, and you can also ignore them on the fly as you wish. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So let me call uh, Sumit Dupar, I hope I pronounced this correctly, from Cyber Intellectuals. Five minutes, go. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good. So how many of you guys have been bothered every day in the morning from inside sales calls from security companies and you just hang up or you keep getting bothered? Yeah, how many of you guys? All of you. Well, just connect with us and nobody's going to bother you except us. <laughs> so I'm um, starting off for a company. At this time, we are, the biggest problem is the scalability with the companies. A um, lot of cybersecurity products, they manufacture their product, but they miss some points here and there, and they're unable to scale their product and kind of losing the trust with the clients. And they develop one product and they prototype their product with some other product and just kind of 5-10% change and you cannot get a client. So we are here to solve this problem of scalability, compliance, and skills. We are based out of USA and Dusseldorf, Germany. Our biggest hunch is to solve the scalability problem with a lot of cybersecurity companies and fix the compliance factor, especially in the European. Skills. With this emerging technology market, where we see a lot of emerging IoT and blockchain in the rise, there is a big scale gap. And a lot of companies who are developing this product, they're focusing on many artifacts, but they're unable to burn the nudge that how we are able to fix each and every answers or solve the answer for each of these uh, IoT clients who cannot even afford to pay for the solutions or three, four solutions which are providing different, different answers or can afford a service. So with Cyber Intellectuals, um, uh, it's a, uh, our flagship product called uh, Alliance API. We are fixing the gap and that's my team. Um, that's my team uh, from uh, David, uh, that's me, Sumit. And uh, I'm a life student, and we have a marketing officer. <laughs> so, as I was explaining, uh, the emerging technology, with this high rise in the emerging technology, we are building a mesh of blockchain, IoT, AI, ML, and uh, virtual reality. In this segment, at this projected market, it's a $145 billion market where we're collaborating with almost 78 products right now, and we are, our mesh ecosystem uh, takes the information from the clients, and then we kind of build the heuristics within our ecosystem. That ecosystem translates the information for the client, and the, uh, our, all our collaborative partners who are basically um, endpoint security to bot detection to matrix and heuristics, they all get the feed from our API integration so that they don't see the clients and client is preserved. We save the meta hash information into our ecosystem that provide the real true positive information to the client. That saves a lot of time for the clients. So we are a true nudge API system integrator, which is real time, and we provide the data science, computing, and single pane of glass visibility. So that's our real solution. We have analytics engine into our ecosystem and our dynamic translator and the API connectivity that takes care of the user configuration, client infrastructure, content data, heuristics, and connectivity. What do I mean by that? User configuration. So every user data is preserved, especially in, in European market, which is a compliance product. So our product completely keeps the meta information completely uh, private, and it's kind of a key integration. And if the client just leave us, we just snaps the connection, and the whole key integration is gone, the data is worthless. Client infrastructure, so every client infrastructure is very complex, and they don't want to provide a lot of information. So we are just a passive integration, so we don't take the real, um, we don't kindly, we just kind of connect with them in a passive mode, and we listen to the method and provide them the real data. 
And heuristics, which is a true positive data that kind of keeps the information true. So this is our, uh, so we are a founding team of uh, enterprise and IoT experts, and uh, we are kind of a good record of uh, providing true client data, and we are into this market now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you provide some more uh, data on, on your uh, capabilities specifically in the AppSec market? Yes. So we are collaborating with like, a lot of AppSec market companies, uh, especially in the pen test uh, application security. So when IoT companies who are especially the um, medical companies and uh, a lot of uh, transportation companies, they are look looking for testing their real users where we connect with those data and provide them the website testing. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, and so last but not least, uh, Roy Liao from Salt Security. Five minutes go. APIs are everywhere, with the estimated size of $2.2 trillion today. As a matter of a fact, almost every company here in the audience expose API with their customer data. But the way we built and architect our application has completely changed in the last few years. And with new technologies came new threats. In the past, this was the typical architecture for traditional web app. You had a client sends a request, uh, to the server, the server render a complete HTML page with the data embedded in it, return it back to the client, and display it. And then you had the common attack methods like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, RFI, that led to the development of products like Web Application Firewall, RASP, um, you know, code scanners, uh, et cetera, to mitigate most of those risks. Today, the world is uh, transformed into something that looks more like this. You have different clients for mobile apps, web application that now a single page application. You have IoT devices all communicating using REST APIs. And if you look at the past attack method, most of them became non-relevant, nor prevalent as before, because of two main reasons. The first one is that a lot of these technologies became obsolete, like PHP for applications for your web app. So that's why the attacks became obsolete as well. The second thing that you had now uh, ORMs and modern application frameworks that uh, are now protecting seamlessly against most uh, SQL injection and code injection attacks. In fact, in over 90% of our POCs, we see uh, critical data exfiltration companies, uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, critical account takeover uh, vulnerabilities as well that would bypass any traditional security solutions today. That's exactly the reason why the biggest brands have been breached in the last year through API vulnerabilities. If you review case by case, you will see that each of them was using the new attack methods. Facebook is a great example. They are now facing up to $1.6 billion in fine because of their API breach. Um, and you can see that today's solution will not protect you against those threats. They're only looking for known attack patterns. And they're not granular enough to understand the uniqueness of every API behavior. It's not a coincidence that OWASP is about to release a completely uh, new top 10 threats for the API security project. So let me walk you through a common scenario of an API breach. You have John, a super experienced developer at Acme, was requested to add a user profile page as a new feature to their web app. So he codes the following API logic to request a specific user data uh, and add a user profile page. Meanwhile, the attacker looking for vulnerable spots notices John's new feature and begins to manipulate the logic. So remove the user ID field, so instead of filtering one user, boom, all user data of all Acme customers are exposed. And the next thing you know, you are in the news. So let me walk you through the exact same scenario if Acme uses SALT. So the minute the John new feature is out, the security team becomes aware that there is a new API with PII that they need to review. Our discovery module eliminates blind spots and provides granular visibility to your API environment. As soon as the attackers start to pop the API for vulnerabilities, our prevention module will detect it in the very first attempts. We are the only patent technology for identifying and prevent API attacks specifically. We leverage big data and AI to establish a very granular baseline of the legitimate behavior of the API, and then we detect all the abnormal and malicious activities. We correlate it to specific user to determine if the user is just behaving abnormal or it's real attackers and then take action. And lastly, to close the loop, Sol bridge the gap between security and development by providing to developer actionable remediation insights 
about what is vulnerable and how they can fix it quickly. And the best part, there is no manual configuration and no proxy deployment. And if you think about it, it returns attackers to your own penetration testers. Our team has a deep background in the cybersecurity industry, all of these scale companies from zero to over $100 million in revenues. Our R&D think like attackers because we are excellent of the cybersecurity units of the IDF and already built enterprise-grade products from scratch. So in conclusion, APIs are everywhere and API attacks are happening now. Don't wait and just uh, add some salt to your security stack. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I have two questions, and they're related. Um, you, you showed there was this nice slide with the stuff moving. Uh, you showed new attacks. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the categories there are, are, I wouldn't call them new. We've been doing them on normal web application for a while. Why do you think they're new? I think it's mostly because of the change of API became the central component for an app. It was in the past, uh, there was, uh, the API was a niche component. Now you have most of the apps became only REST API with single page application. So yeah, but, but improper access or broken access control was in web apps too. I did that 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. No APIs. Yeah, so I think it's more about uh, the API becoming more rich in functionality. So you have your more lo logical flows. Um, so they became like the majority of the gaps because you cover the old, uh, the old ones. Uh, and then you have the new ones that are responsible for most of the breaches recently. OK, and then, and then the second question. Um, I think if you look at some of the names I mentioned in, in my initial pitch around WAFs, they were trying to do behavioral detection of such vulnerabilities. So how do you think you can solve the problem that other bigger companies failed? Yeah, that's a very great, uh, good question. If you look at all the other companies, you see that their architecture will build to package everything in one VM that you're supposed to do everything. But it's really a big data uh, problem. And only with the recent development of technologies, you are, we are able to collect everything, analyze everything in big data, and able to look at the big picture over a month, for example, of API to model the behavior, and then to uh, tailor and, uh, uh, or consolidate the alerts and looking at the big picture. It wasn't possible. You can't do that in one VM. OK, thank you very much. Very interesting. So I hope that was interesting to you as much as it was for me. Um, we're going to ask you to vote. You don't have to vote now. Uh, you can keep this link. Uh, we'll put it up tonight as well when you're in the uh, networking event. Uh, so if you want to vote, you can go there. You can vote now. You can go and vote after you talk to the companies this evening. Um, again, there's no security in place. You're not going to be very lead for hacking it because Anybody can hack it and uh, just vote for fun. Um, thank you. Oh, move back. Okay, I'm going to leave it up for a while as I'm uh, introducing our next speaker. So I'm very honored to introduce Amit Klein. Amit is one of the longest app time application security experts in the market. Um, I've learned a lot from him when I just started in the space. Um, I'm honored to be working on and off alongside him for many, many years, and even more so with 20 years to AppScan to bring him here as our keynote for this innovation afternoon. So thank you, Amit, for coming. And thank you for inviting me, Ofer, Avi. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and attending my uh, uh, keynote speech at such a late hour. <laughs> Can I get the uh, presentation? Or? Hmm. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, I'm officially starting now. And uh, again, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to my uh, keynote speech uh, about lessons from the early web application security days. So a bit about myself. Uh, the most important part of my uh, resume is the fact that I joined a small Israeli startup called uh, back then Perfecto Technologies 
1997, uh, and I uh, was with that startup until 2004 uh, in various roles. Uh, last of them, and uh, most uh, importantly, uh, director of uh, security and research, where I was responsible for the security for the security content of. Uh, uh, the uh, Perfector Sanctum products. Then I moved to become chief scientist of uh, SEOTA, which is an anti-fraud, was anti-fraud Israeli startup back then. Uh, it was acquired by RSA. RSA were acquired by AMC. Uh, as a fascinating anecdote, the uh, morning uh, uh, keynote speaker, Michal uh, uh, blumenstick Braverman, was also there with me in uh, SEOTA. Then I moved to become the CTO of Trustier uh, in 2006, uh, and I also managed the uh, security group there, and Trustier was acquired by IBM in 2013 for many, many hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm not allowed to disclose the exact sum. Uh, I stayed with IBM for a year and a half after the acquisition, and then I moved to another Israeli cybersecurity startup called SafeBridge uh, in 2015, and that's where I am today. I'm the VP of Security Research for uh, SafeBridge, uh, and I'm doing some academic research on the side. So why me, why now? First, because Offer and Avi invited me, and when these two gentlemen invite me, I like to uh, come and, uh, and, and I accept the invitation, of course. But uh, seriously, it's because we celebrate around 20 years of web application security, and if we are to be uh, very uh, accurate, as you will see later in this presentation, it's actually more or less 20 years since the introduction of the first commercial web application firewall uh, by that com little startup uh, I worked for uh, called Perfecto. And it's interesting because I was there right uh, from the beginning, uh, right when the uh, commercial web application security uh, market uh, started to form. So I have uh, an interesting uh, vantage point uh, of how a web application security uh, uh, started, at least uh, commercially, and how this uh, research area, arena, market, niche, whatever you like to call it, uh, actually formed and, and, and started. And uh, with this uh, unique experience, and from this unique experience, there's a lot to learn, I believe, about innovation and about startup life cycle and about the position and, and role of research in uh, evolving and emerging markets. Uh, I need to, uh, I need to um, mention, though, um, uh, the following fact. Uh, I was not an executive in Perfector Sanctum, so my point of view on some uh, decisions and some cases was uh, limited or, or second-hand. Uh, I knew, of course, all the uh, management team in, uh, in Sanctum, uh, but, I was, but in some cases I was not in the room when the decisions were taken. Um, before I begin to, um, so to speak, uh, bureaucratic notes, I'm talking about Perfecto Technologies and Sanctum uh, as an interchangeable uh, company names. Uh, the company started as Perfecto Technologies and then uh, got uh, its name changed in uh, mid-2000 to, uh, to uh, Sanctum. And I'm not going to mention any names of uh, executives, uh, researchers, uh, team leaders, developers, and so forth. I don't think that this is uh, too important. Uh, the, the personal, uh, uh, the personal aim, uh, perspective or personal angel is not as important as the actual decisions and actions of the company. And if I were to thank all the people that, who contributed to Perfecto Sanctum, that, that would be a very long list of people, and I, surely I'd forget some people, and that would be awkward. So, no names. So the first observation about uh, Sanctum or Perfectum was the uh, composition of its uh, core team. And I'm talking about the people who were, who were there in 1997, 1998, the people who actually uh, were the first employees, the, the co-founders and the first five to six employees. Uh, as you can see, among the three co-founders, one is now a, a security startup VC, a founder and, and manager. Another one is a serial entrepreneur, 
And the third one is a professor of game theory. And among the five or six uh, non-founding core team members, two of them are actually uh, professors, one for neural interfaces and another one for crypto. Now, I'm, I uh, mentioned the fact that there we have like uh, three professors out of uh, the nine, eight, nine core team members as an indication of the quality of the team. I'm not saying, of course, that uh, people must become professors in order for, in order for me to uh, uh, acknowledge or, or, or understand that they are uh, uh, very wise, very talented, very highly intelligent people, but it's, it, I think it is a common indication that uh, uh, um, we, are we are looking at a fine uh, set of uh, highly talented, highly intelligent people. And I, uh, I challenge you to look at the uh, core team of startups that you are familiar with and ask yourselves, is, is, this, is this group, uh, does this group contain about one third, say, uh, uh, one, one third of the core group is what, you, what I'd call uh, professor material? It's, it's a good question. And I think it's a challenging question. Uh, so, and the bottom line is that, well, we had a bunch of pretty smart, uh, pretty wise people, present company excluded, of course. So, obviously, with, with such a group, uh, you get, from such a group, you get uh, many interesting ideas. Uh, and I think most of the ideas came from uh, the uh, actually the uh, co-founders, but some of them also from the uh, from the group at large. And the question is, how do you choose among them? Now I try to recollect and, and to recall what what were the uh, competing ideas. I managed to find uh, four of them. I think there were five or six, so I probably missed one or two. Anyway, the ones that I could remember are pretty interesting. So. One idea, is, one idea we toyed with was a software-only hypervisor for Windows NT. Now, keep in mind that at, the, at that era, I'm talking about late 97 to 98, the, the computers, the CPUs were, the CPU line was Pentium Pro or Pentium 2. I don't know if you remember those uh, ancient machines. Um, they had hardware, hardware assisted virtualization for the old 86 mod, which was a 16-bit uh, memory model, but they had zero hardware virtualization for protected mode, which was the new mode. Well, for, for us today, it's the native mode of, for, for, for decades, but for, back, at, back at the time, it was a pretty new and, and exciting mode, and Windows NT uh, used that mode extensively, and it had no uh, hardware virtualization systems uh, in the in the CPU, and yet we managed to write a nice little hypervisor for NT4 kernel, which was able to to boot the kernel uh, and but to actually in in a virtual in a software virtualization mode, which is uh, I think quite uh, quite impressive. However, rumors started to uh, to uh, reach us about a company called VMware that were uh, working on a similar uh, product. And in fact, VMware uh, launched their, uh, their competing product, work, uh, VMware Workstation, in May 1999. And obviously, they were quite ahead of us in terms of um, product uh, maturity and, and stability and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so if we were to, to proceed with uh, the idea of uh, virtu uh, software virtualization of hypervisor, uh, we'd probably end up as number two in this market. Now, whether this was a good idea or not is uh, an interesting, though hypothetical question. I remind you that VMware got acquired by EMC in 2004 for a nice sum of $625 million. And it's a good question, what would be the valuation in 2004 uh, of of the uh, um, of the second place of the number two uh, uh, vendor in this field, you, your guess is probably as good as mine. But it's an interesting thing to to recall to, to keep in mind that we are talking about 2004, and we'll get to this uh, to this year later on in this presentation. 
Another idea we toyed with was uh, what we call today CAPTCHA. Obviously, back then, we did not call it a CAPTCHA. It was just a, a, a concept that uh, uh, we had a different name for a different internal name for it. Would, it would be an intellectual property play, uh, but we abandoned this direction because we couldn't find a good implement, a good enough implementation, i.e., one that we believed that uh, could not be solved by a, by a computer. And we'll come back to this point later when I'll talk about uh, good security versus perfect security. Keep it in mind. Another interesting idea we toyed with was a protocol and application aware gateway. Uh, it was supposed to be an elaborate scheme uh, which had two, two physical boxes uh, separated almost with an, something somewhat similar to AirGap, uh, or parsing uh, the, the incoming protocol in the external box, and then the external box would transfer the Pass data over a, a twisted pair cable with our own set of uh, device drivers and, and, and protocol and simple protocol to the internal box and the internal box would reconstruct uh, the, uh, the protocol in a safe manner and transmit it internally to the, the destination server. And uh, the thought was that this could be a very, very secure protocol sanita sanitization solution. And on top of all those uh, software products, the idea was that we'll have the whole software formally verified. And in fact, I originally joined the uh, Perfector slash Sanctum in order to uh, lead this, uh, this project of formal verification. Uh, there was, uh, there was just a little problem. Back in 1998, formal verification was in its infancy. There were no adequate tools and methodologies and, and actually algorithmics to, per, to effectively and efficiently carry out formal verification. As a result, in order to formally verify a few, few dozen lines of, code, of concurrent code, I needed to analyze this code together with the developer, sit with the developer, the developer needs to explain to me what's important and what's not. I need to model this in a way that re removes all the uh, parts that are not necessary and then feed it to the model checker. The model checker will crunch it for half a day, day, and then will yield a result saying yes or no whether this uh, code um, um, it w fulfills the, the requirement that I also needed to formulate. On the other hand, our software development team uh, churned code at magnitude of kilos of lines of code per day, so this didn't really converge. As a result, we wrote a nice paper about our experience, which is, we'll keep that in mind, we'll get back to that. Um, and we, um, and the project practically got abandoned in late 1998, and keep that in mind as well, I'm gonna get back to that. So, as you can imagine, eventually the one technology that uh, we selected as a product was the protocol and application aware uh, gateway, uh, which we named ClearNet. And this actually was the first commercial web application firewall. It was announced in late 1998, I believe, um, and its first installation was with the Israeli electric company in early 1999, uh, which uh, makes them the, an early adapter of uh, web application security technology, believe it or not. And then we renamed this uh, product AppShield, mid 1999. Uh, as I explained, there were two, the, the initial deployment or, or the initial form factor was two physical boxes connected with, with a twisted pair Ethernet cable. cable. And it was uh, all around uh, parsing and, and transferring HTTP protocol uh, and HTTP request from the uh, exterior to the interior in a secure manner uh, while sanitizing the HTTP protocol. And of course, in order to do that, we needed to, uh, to uh, write our own HTTP parser. It was based on RFC 2068, which is HTTP 1.0. Uh, it was based on the, on the BNF uh, tree structure. 
And I just remind you that it's, we are talking so early in, in, in the life of web application security that the RFC 2616, which describes HTTP 1.1, was, on, was not even released at that time. And then we started to bump into, into trouble. So HTTP in the wild, back, at least back in 1998, was not really RFC compliant. Everyone just wrote their own HTTP and, and, and uh, that was it. So we had to code a much more forgiving protocol uh, very quickly because we already had the product out there and it was turning in errors and it was quite embarrassing. Moreover, what, uh, the little thing that I neglected to mention so far was the application layer. So, you know, we have, uh, you, you have the application flow or rules uh, which, which URL uh, goes, which URL is allowed to, to follow with which URL, and which, URL, which URLs are, lo are, are allowed, are valid, and which are not. And the solution to that was very simple from our perspective. We'll have a GUI for the application owner to describe the logic rules. So the, the owner would write, would describe the, logic, the valid URLs, and how valid URLs are allowed to transit from each uh, 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 from, from each one to, from each URL to each URL. And we call this uh, lovely component uh, flower or flower. And we actually did have a, a, a mock-up of this uh, GUI on the VPR and this uh, computer. And we were very proud of this achievement. There was only a little problem. It was an awful idea. It was, it was terrible. Uh, the, the mere concept of Having someone at the enterprise that owns the, the, the application is, is ridiculous. Uh, the mere idea that someone, even if there is somebody like that, that, that he or she will be able to describe the application is, is absurd. The idea that uh, he or she will have to maintain this, this uh, complex description when the application changes is, is, is outrageous. Um, so, I think that we didn't, we didn't even get to complete the coding of this beast, of this abomination, before someone had a much better idea, which is to parse the HTML, and the HTML practically contains all the flows that we need. All the, the, the application practically describes itself through its HTML, with forms, and with links, and with images, and with whatnot. So, two problems with this approach. One is that we bumped into a world of HTML quirks. You all know that we all know and love those quirks for cross-site scripting, starting a tag, not ending it correctly, the various variations of, in, in implementation of, of various browsers. All this we bumped into big time. Then there's also the little problem of client-side code, of JavaScript that adds links that changes forms and so forth. While working on AppShield and its problems, the research team, uh, which, into which, I, uh, uh, which was managed by uh, yours truly, did some internal red team effort to um, try to attack AppShield and see uh, how it fares. And we independently discovered, but never published, some interesting uh, results that are today known and because they were published by other researchers, such as the range request uh, denial of service, range header, and some issues with uh, host headers. So, um, so we was, so, so Amshield was a nice, the theoretically was a nice concept, the WAF, our WAF solution was a nice concept, but uh, it, uh, it hit reality uh, very badly. Uh, I, re I remind you that we were first to the market with, with for the web application firewall technology, and the market was not quite ready for it. Uh, a lot of uh, potential customers did not understand the need, they did not understand the pain. Uh, we struggled with usability problems, especially around client-side code. We tried to address those issues uh, using a learning mode uh, that would try to uh, generalize uh, some, uh, some rules 
that, that were not part of the HTML rules that would uh, describe the uh, allow JavaScript behavior. We had some limited and degenerate, even, we, we did even have a limited and degenerate mode of JavaScript execution to help us uh, um, to help us approximate the possible URLs that are generated by JavaScript. But all this came too little and too late, uh, and really uh, uh, the AppShield project was, was not a great success. It also had another set of problems because it was an in-path component. It was an in-path component and therefore was a critical component in the, in the organization. If, app, if an AppShield machine would crash, the organization would lose access or, or the, the, the uh, organization customers would lose access to the website and that was a great big no-no. So it also touches uh, areas like performance uh, and uh, form factor. Uh, AppShield was uh, offered as a software-only user space uh, uh, process. It's, it was not an appliance as it should probably have been. And for all these reasons, AppShield did not sell too well. Uh, fortunately, at that time, uh, we started looking at, uh, at another idea, another concept. Uh, the original thought was that we, we are missing a key component in our upshield sales cycle, which is to demonstrate to the customer, to the potential customer, that he or she has problems, real vulnerabilities and problems in the website. Um, so we started toying with the idea of a tool that would help us uh, show those su such vulnerabilities in the site, and very soon we. Uh, uh, figured out that this could be a standalone uh, and, and very successful and needed product. It was not just a, a demonstration for, for AppShield. And so we started to develop this, uh, this tool, this AppScan, this AppScan tool. The early versions were pretty simple uh, uh, Dust uh, uh, concept, uh, crawl, automatic crawler plus, uh, plus a proxy component for manual uh, crawling. A parser to extract uh, URLs and forms, attack module to, ge to uh, generate attacks per the URLs and forms uh, detected, and a response assessment to understand whether the attack was successful or not. Uh, the version 1.0, which I believe came out in the year 2000, was actually something very, I would say almost barbaric. It was a Linux standalone server uh, that uh, that generated the attacks and, and, the, and the crawling, and it would be and it was consumed by a, by opening a browser to it, and the user in, in version 1.0 would get a list of links, and the user would have to click through the links in order to uh, to run the attacks, and it would get back the uh, HTML, the response HTML, because the, we did not have in 1.0 uh, any response assessment component. And even this obviously <laughs> very basic offering <laughs> was, could be sold, which is amazing. That's, two, that's the year 2000 for you. In order to really make apps can work, we had to code some attacks into it. Uh, and in order for that to happen, we needed to study how websites uh, behave in the wild and to be able to uh, uh, legally attack sites. So we had two offerings back then, uh, the app audit service, was, which was a paid for uh, uh, audit. And we also had uh, some free audits for, uh, for prospects. And all, all, these, all these offerings were managed by the security team. And we learned a lot from this exercise. Uh, actually, we published uh, three papers called uh, some cookie poisoning for Cold Fusion, which was one of the most successful application servers back in, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, and some generic uh, uh, papers about HTTP attacks called HTTP response splitting and HTTP request smuggling. And we uh, managed to find, we managed to formulate tons of apps and rules, tweaks, and response assessment, fine tuning, etc. So this, the exercise of of, of attacking live, uh, legally attacking live sites, was of immense uh, um, uh, immense uh, um, importance uh, um, in our ability to 
produce uh, quality content for AppScan and, um, and, uh, and, and to, to be able to, to provide us with, with materials for, for research and, 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 for, uh, uh, and, and, and for improvement. So, back, so in around year 2000, we had two products, AppShield, which was a WAF, and AppScan, which was a, a, a dynamic application security testing tool. Uh, and obviously, there was one of them is was much more successful than the other. So, um, so obviously, we should have spent or we should have dumped AppShield, but we didn't. And in fact, in 2004, uh, that was several years after the two, year 2000 bubble burst, Sanctum was acquired by Watchfire, which was a Canadian startup back then. Uh, and Watchfire did the right thing. They dumped AppShield, uh, they dumped their own product, moved to AppScan, dumped AppShield, and got acquired by IBM in 2007, three years later, uh, in a nine-digit nine deal. So, what does all this uh, what does all this teaches us i think the takeaway number 1 is that technology and brain power are simply not enough like i said we had an amazing core team in in sanctum uh, and yet uh, we didn't we, we didn't really uh, become a, a hugely successful company because I think we lost a lot of focus both in, the, in, in two uh, phases, both in, in selecting our, our product, our technology, back in 1998, sort of, uh, or circa 1998, and then again, uh, the fact that we had two products running side by side, uh, only one of them was, was very successful, uh, but, uh, but at the same, but, but we did not find it in our heart to to dump AppShield and to just uh, move to to a pure apps can play. I think we also uh, didn't understand well the market, the needs, our users, our use cases, the whole idea of of having an uh, an owner for the application that will be will go through the effort or through the 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 pain of ex, of, of describing urls and, and transition was was very immature in terms of market and in understanding markets and user space and end user cases and uh, and and, and uh, enterprise politics uh, we also didn't do so well on understanding the technological environment, at least on our first days. Um, the fact that we, we naively thought that we'll just implement an HTTP parser based on the, on the RFC was, uh, again, uh, quite, uh, quite an immature uh, approach. And of course, uh, we lacked, as a company, we lacked on the execution and, and sales de uh, department. Uh, uh, obviously, a different uh, management and different and, and, and different focus uh, were, were with a different management, different focus. Watchfire were able to grow sales and to eventually get a, a, um, a respectable acquisition. The second takeaway is perfect security versus good enough security. Now, then. Those, the, the core team of, uh, of Perfecto, again, I'm getting back to the core team in uh, 1998, give or take, was, well, again, a bunch of uh, smart uh, people. We were all coming from uh, the, we were all fresh out of the army or almost fresh out of the army. And in the Israeli army, if, you, if you're familiar with it, uh, IT security, or is or was at least back then, um, of top priority, and, uh, and, and in the army, it's very clear that if you have uh, some uh, uh, regu regulations or instructions concerning um, IT security, they are followed uh, to the letter, and and uh, and the IT security is is like a, a, again um, something of utmost important. Uh, in the army, and especially in, uh, in intelligence units, and I'm sure you, uh, uh, you can imagine why. And that's, that was our state of mind. And that was a, um, a pretty poisonous state of mind um, uh, because, uh, well, in the industry, 
they were not thinking, uh, in, they are not thinking in, in absolute terms. Uh, and we were, but, but we were, so we thought formal verification, but actually no one cares. Uh, they just want the software to work. And we were thinking about physical separation, and again, no one cares, and if there are security bugs, just go and fix them as soon as possible and be done with that. And we were thinking, when we uh, thought about CAPTCHA, we were thinking about something like uh, uh, the absolute security where, which no computer can, can break, but we know that there are tons of CAPTCHAs out there, and people still use CAPTCHAs even though computers can break them. Uh, the, takeaway, the third takeaway is research market education. Um, show of hand, who knows what CSS is? Great. Cascading style sheets, right? Wrong. <laughs> Back in the year 2000, CSS in, in, our, in the security circles was cross-site scripting. In fact, uh, cross-site scripting was first uh, described in, to the public in a cert advisor from February 2000, um, call, call the, uh, uh, mysteriously called malicious HTML tags embedded in client web requests. Now, they didn't do a very good job of, uh, edu of market education. Sure, uh, security experts uh, could read this uh, cert advisor and understand it, but no one else could. No CISOs or developer could, no CISO or developer could read this, uh, this uh, advisory and figure out what's going on. So when apps can start turning in cross-site scripting uh, uh, issues in, in customer websites, people came to me and asked me, what, uh, what is this product talking about? So I had to write a paper called CSS Explained. Uh, again, CSS, because back then it was not XSS. And in fact, it became one of the probably the most popular paper I ever wrote, even though I didn't invent uh, the concept I was talking about. I just explained it in simple, uh, uh, simple concepts, with diagrams, with charts, with, uh, with illustrations, with simple and easy to follow use case. And that was it, ladies and gentlemen. And more or less the same happened in 2005 with my paper about, uh, about DOM-based XSS. Again, I did not invent this concept. I actually described uh, several uh, vulnerabilities in the, that were described before the, before the paper uh, as a basis for my paper. I just noticed that it's a, simp it's a different beast than uh, uh, reflected or stored cross-site scripting. And again, I explained it in a very simple, uh, in, a very, in, in simple words, uh, with simple examples, and it was, again, one, uh, probably the second most popular paper I ever wrote. So if you are approaching a new security market or a new niche, uh, and you have you discovered or, or you want to describe uh, technical security problems, sure, submit them to Black Hat, submit them to OWASP, whatnot, but also write something for the CISOs and developers of the world to consume, something simple and straightforward with illustration, with diagrams, with simple use cases. The fourth takeaway is be flexible. So I, as you recall, I, um, I, was, uh, uh, I was brought into Perfecto to manage the formal verification project. project. Now that formal verification project was canceled about a year after I, uh, I arrived. And it was the trivial thing for me was to, to quit and to go to another company. Uh, instead, I stayed and I uh, started researching uh, practical web application security. And I think it was probably one of my best career moves. So if you are, in, if you are getting into a new uh, uh, research area, a new, uh, com a new startup, you need to take into account the fact that a year later, two years later, things will shift, possibly even dramatically. Uh, and my recommendation is be, be flexible, keep an open mind. Maybe this new direction will be good for you. The fifth and last takeaway is submit to conferences. My original sin throughout my career was not submitting enough to conferences. I think that good research should be presented in good conferences. And I also encourage you to submit not only to in industrial uh, conferences like uh, DEF CON, Black Hat, OASP, whatnot, also to academic conferences. If uh, you ever consider an academic career, some uh, papers accepted to peer-reviewed uh, uh, 
uh, high-ranking uh, uh, con academic conferences is meaningful. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much.